It's a transparent and open organization, open to everyone, that was recently formed to unite a broad audience of stakeholders around the cause of advancing literacy levels in our society. We're focused on the enactment of literacy and dyslexia laws across the United States in order to unite the field of literacy around this urgent need to do two very important things. First, to ensure that all of our nation's young citizens become literate, educated, and college and career ready. And second, equally important, to support all teachers in acquiring the professional knowledge needed to ensure the success of the diverse student population of the 21st century. The second, um, I would like to add five words, if you don't mind, to Stuart's um, ten-word ditty, um, and that would be give the teachers the knowledge to give the students the tools to read and succeed. A number of years ago, I realized that um, good reading instruction is good reading instruction, as a colleague would say, and it works, good reading instruction that works for children with dyslexia work works for the, the, what we call now the SEEDS kids. The SEEDS kids are the children who have um, specific language disability, the children who are English learners, the children who are economically disadvantaged, the dyslexics, and um, the struggling readers. So you bring more people together. You find that common cause that Jim was talking about. And I think there's more that unites us as a group, whether we're advocating for our dyslexic children or we're talking about the children in poverty that Jan talked about earlier. These children really have more that, that I think um, bring them together and their needs are, are really similar in that they need very skilled teachers. Teachers who understand the structure of language that you know Blanche was talking about earlier. Earlier, and when you have that deep knowledge as a teacher, you then not only recognize the children who are struggling early on, but then you raise your hand and say, "I can't help this child, but I know this child needs the help, and I'm going to find my colleague who does and has that deeper knowledge." And the system works better that way. As the White House announces its plan to really bolster the whole continuum of supports for zero through third grade. There will be many conversations and many decisions about how to do that. And if we're going to do it so it improves results for kids, it has to have the knowledge that you currently possess around what needs to be available for all kids in the way of assessment, early identification, the least needed intervention, and pathways and on-ramps towards normal development. So I see that you are no longer like just we're an ice, you know we're this isolated group and competing against the you know all the monolithic forces in the public education. You actually have something that the country needs because you understand that all kids need to be assessed, kids need to learn differently, and that those opportunities need to be normalized. Another reason that we're here is because it's not like it's only a few kids. So I'm going to try and, as Stuart said, I'm going to try and go through the numbers slowly because they are truly staggering. So what I'm reading from is the latest NAEP, NAEP, National, Associate, National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is a uh, test that's given to uh, a limited sample of children if, at this case, uh, the very beginning of the fourth grade, and it is benchmarked against other countries. So unlike state tests, which race to the bottom, this test actually is standardized based on what we need to be doing in order to be competitive globally. So as of, and it's given every two years. So this is 2011 data. 82% <clears throat> of low-income children are reading below proficient. Okay, so the NAEP has basic, proficient, and advanced. Where we want our children to be in order to have the kind of literacy needed to face the complexities that they will face, whether it's globalization, climate change, geopolitics, think of what the next generation is gonna to have to face in terms of, of social problems. So we just don't want kids that can go, Jan Jackson, I can read that, but have the ability of language acquisition, critical thinking skills, comprehension. 82%. 82% of children who are poor in America 
are below proficient. Proficient is grade level, right? Proficient at grade level. Yeah. Proficient at grade level. Uh, the total, including those kids who are poor as well as well off, 68%. So two thirds of all children in America are below proficient as at the beginning of the month of their fourth grade. Now, there's enormous variations that also have been, you can't see this, I wish we had a PowerPoint, but this, this uh, social economic gap in proficiency has been stubborn and persistent for the last 10 years. It's not like it's recent. It has been pretty steady and persistent for the last 10 years. And I think if we go back, it's been pretty stubborn and persistent decades before that as well. If we look at racial differences, we see huge racial gaps. 84% of fourth graders who are African American are below proficient. 82% of our American Indian population below proficient. The total is 68% or two thirds. Okay, so that's, those are the two numbers. Two thirds of all fourth graders below proficient and it's four fifths of low income kids. So this is not a, you know, a rare phenomena. This is sort of epidemic. And why another reason why it's of a particular concern is the largest uh, demographic group that um, rise in demographic groups is the rising Hispanic population. So America is on a trajectory to become a uh, majority children of color within the next you know, less than 20 years. Uh, we're seeing astronomical growth of our Hispanic population. Those kids are in zero, you know, in pre-kindergarten, first grade, second grade today. Those are the kids that are more likely to be poor, mm -hmm. more likely not to be able to read, may have English language learning, all of those kids need what you know. Early assessment, right. customized mm -hmm. learning, getting them on track as quickly as possible. If we're gonna have a workforce, if we're gonna have a, um, a democracy in the next 20 or 30 years, this is a matter of national importance. I think this is where it becomes so clear that we really do have common cause with the, uh, the larger literacy movement. I mean, those are startling statistics. Uh, when you look at individuals or students with, with learning disabilities, we're looking at nearly 50% of them being at least three grades behind mm -hmm. in reading. And you think about what it takes for a school uh, and for gifted teachers to accelerate the learning progress mm -hmm. for students like that, to move them one grade up, two grades up, three grades up. It is just an enormous lift. I mean, it is difficult stuff. And this is where, this is why it makes so much sense for us to work together on this issue. I think it's really important to focus. We know the train leaving the station these days is early childhood education mm -hmm. with a lot of governors with the president. We know mm -hmm. that grade level reading requires early movement intervention and help for kids. It's a golden opportunity, it's a moment. The blessing is that funders are working together, all of you are working together, we all recognize at the bottom line, this isn't about us. This is about what would a group of fourth graders watching us say? Now, I was gonna say what would a group of 18 year olds say, but that's scary, I can't do that. <laughs> so let's just stay with fourth graders. Are we serving them well, but why what we are doing as adults? A couple of last things. Um, the perfect can never be the enemy of the good, and there's gonna be imperfection. It is not gonna be the way we would all design it and waiting for perfection is gonna take a long time. There's no secret sauce, there's no single answer, there's no magic pill, but we do know a pretty good recipe, and we've seen it work, and there's examples, whether it's Vero Beach or anywhere. Uh, we also understand that state and federal work are not the antithesis of one another. It's not state or federal. It's how you use opportunities at a state level to create action that can interact at a federal level. And if you get into the policy world, remember that, as the governor said, it's federal, state, and local.